All right, good morning. Good morning. So the plan for today is to take a day and really get into some depth around use of single case methods to advance the science that you're already doing. David and I have been working together for about 15 years over time in terms of looking at different ways to advance single case methods. And what we're really hoping to do today is to start with some basics, get into some more advanced pieces, and to the extent we can, tailor things to things that you actually are really interested in. We're a small enough group that we can actually do all sorts of different things. So how many of you have actually conducted a single case study? Ah, uh, not that many. All right. So. I'm assuming the rest of you are anxiously preparing to conduct a, a single case study. So here's, here's essentially what we want to do. By today, by uh, 4 o'clock, we want you to be able to say, here's, here is a way that I could use single case methods to actually answer a question that I'm really interested in. Some of you are really focused on advancing issues with respect to autism spectrum disorder. What are some other areas that you all are focused on? What are some content areas? Please. Uh, teacher impact. Teacher impact. So if you're going to really look at the extent to which we can help teachers to be more effective, how would, what would be the smallest behaviors, smallest set of behaviors that would increase the efficiency and effectiveness of a teacher to advance the educational outcomes of kids? And how would you use single case methods to tease that out? All right, we can do that. Uh, a couple more, please. Physical activity and motor skills. Physical activity and motor skills. Give me a little more context. Uh, so using a certain uh, prompting procedure to increase their motor performance. In what kind of motor performance? Uh, do so it? gross motor performance. So like throwing, Throwing a baseball at least 98 miles an hour within a two, yeah, good timely uh, arena there. All right. Yes. Uh, actually, there's there's a whole series of studies that are being done primarily within uh, physical and health education context, looking at that. The the fun parts are looking at issues related to developing the kind of uh, athletic and exercise types of things. But the other things that we're actually doing are looking at how do you help kids who have experienced some type of traumatic brain injury or some type of disability to develop um, more precise uh, motor coordination skills. And the, the fascinating thing, one of the great things that we're doing, uh, that I enjoy doing at Oregon, is we're combining work in psychology, special education, and neuroscience. So we can actually use real-time uh, neuroscience feedback systems. Uh, a guy named Dean Inman, for example, you'll love this one, actually taught kids who had lost Finkster control, right, which is a big problem, um, set up these little kids who were not able to control their Sphinxers, and he put together a biofeedback mechanism so that uh, they could make an electric train go by using their Sphinxster muscle, right? And then he used single case methods basically to bring that under stimulus control so that they were able to use an alternative mechanism. So you don't necessarily need to go quite that far, but just uh, an example. One more, another content area that you all are interested in. Please. Staff training. Staff? Training. In? Uh, so training staff uh, to implement maybe some different behavioral procedures. Oh, yes. Great. Okay, well, I'll actually show you some studies where we've actually done that. So here's the plan. Uh, we've done introductions. My task is to get us started. So between now and 10.30, uh, we're going to launch into some basic criteria and a basic context. Then David is going to take us into some of the real challenges with respect to uh, analysis and methods. A, um, I, in the afternoon, we're going to look at more advanced designs, and one of the things that I want you to master today is I actually want you to master the ability to do visual analysis. I'm going to make the argument that 
actually good statistical understanding of single case methods starts by understanding the variables that are driven by visual analysis. So this is something that I want you to be able to combine and link together. You should know that all of us who have been trained in single case methods were all initially trained in group design methods. So this is not an either or type of thing. It's, it's not like a religion or whether you're you know, with Texas A&M or it, this, is, this is like something where use, this, use the research methods that fit the research question that you've got. Now here's essentially part of what um, I'm going to argue. I'm going to argue that if you're interested in human behavior, you should be interested in single case methods. Single case methods are about understanding with precision how people behave <coughs> under different conditions and over time. But part of what we're really getting into is we're getting into the point where if we're going to take what we've learned in behavior analysis and single case methods and extend it to the wider community of science, medicine, sociology, anthropology, political science, groups, structures, we're going to have to be able to address and acknowledge the full range of situations that people are really set up to deal with. That means we need to talk not just about what a single study does, but about the extent to which, for example, we can identify practices that are evidence-based. So you all, by now, one of the things you should be studying is uh, what are evidence-based practices in behavior analysis, in educational psychology, in medicine and sociology. And to what extent are we as society becoming more committed to the enhancement and support of practices that are evidence-based? Right now, one of the biggest challenges we face is that single case methods are not used well to identify practices as evidence-based. I mean, you, you identify an evidence-based practice by having two to three randomized controlled trials that demonstrate both statistical significance and an adequate effect size. Well, if that's the standard, then as, as a field, right, how are we going to use what we're learning about single case to be able to come up with a definition of something of what, what our evidence